So let's look at this. So part A, again, is talking about the maximum transfer speed. So that means we're talking about its harmonic oscillation. So if I'm thinking about this thing at D as a function of time, then this thing is simply doing something like this. So what I want to know is what is its maximum transfer speed? Well, that maximum speed is going to occur when it is at the origin. So for part A, we then know that the maximum speed is then simply equal to the square root. Let me do it this way angular frequency times the amplitude. Now, by looking at this, we can see that the amplitude is simply 2.2 centimeters. We know the angular frequency was 130 radians per second. We know that the wave number, let's go back to it, is equal to 15 radians per meter. So here, our angular frequency is simply given to us directly in the problem. So this is going to be equal to 130 radians per second times 0.022 meters. Look at my numbers. I'm just trying to bring this up initially. Everything shut down on me. So, looking at my numbers, what I find is this works out to be about 2.9 meters per second. Yeah. <clears throat> Part B then is asking about what is the maximum acceleration? Well, we know that the maximum acceleration for the harmonic oscillation occurs when this thing is at its amplitude. So, when this thing has reached its maximum amplitude, this then has the maximum acceleration which means for part B, we know that the maximum acceleration is given by the harmonic oscillation. So that's the angular frequency squared times the amplitude. So in this case, this is an equal to 130 quantity squared times 0 0.022, which then works out to be 371.8 meters per second squared. So this is the maximum transverse acceleration that this guy is going to feel. Part C then wants to know, well, what is the speed of the wave? Well, we now know that the speed of the wave is either equal to the wavelength times the frequency, or this is equal to the angular frequency divided by the wavelength. Now, again, whichever one of these I decide to use doesn't really matter. It just depends on what it is that I know. In this case, we were told directly what omega is and what k is, so it's easier just to use that definition. So this then would be equal to 130 radians per second divided by 15 radians per meter. Yeah. Radians are going to cancel. Meters is going to move to the top, so this is going to be a meter per second. So plug this in, this works out to be 8.7 meters per second. So this is the velocity of a wave. So good. So the last part then, D wants to know, well, why is the answer to A different than the answer to C? Well, again, the difference between A and C is that C is specifically talking about the wave itself. So this is how fast the wave is moving, where then A is talking about how fast the particles are in the harmonic oscillation. So again, if we go back to our simulation here, let it go. The A.7 refers to how fast this wave is, say, traveling to the left. In this case, it's moving to the right, but that's fine. So talking about the speed of the wave itself, where the other one was talking about the velocity that this thing has when it reaches the origin. So this is the maximum speed of the harmonic oscillation. So remember, waves is a little bit more complicated because now it is two objects. Again, it's the harmonic oscillation of a single piece of medium as it moves through time. And then the wave itself is talking about how this thing is actually moving and what speed is actually moving. So it turns out that we can actually create new waves by adding existing waves together. This is what's called interference. So we now want to start looking about interference of waves. So interference. This is one of the most interesting and unique properties of waves in that interference says that we can create a new wave from two existing waves, two or more actually. 
two or more existing waves. So this is actually the basis of music. And if anybody plays music, you know there's a difference between a note and a chord. Right? A note is simply a single wave, which is given by the fact that, for example, you have a guitar, put your finger at a particular point, you strum the string, it vibrates, that plays a note. If you're gonna play a chord, a chord is made up from multiple, multiple notes. In this case, you're creating that chord by superimposing all of these waves on top of each other. Those super, in, super interference then, or the superposition of all of those different waves creates a new wave, which then has a different amplitude, a different frequency, and et cetera. Right? So this interference of waves then is the basis of basically all music. So we wanna see how does the interference of waves actually work? So in general, we're gonna do this with two different boundaries. So we're gonna look at what happens at a boundary. <coughs> so boundary is, for example, if I have a string here, which then has a boundary point, so it's gonna be our boundary. We're gonna have two different possible types of boundaries. So the boundary is gonna be, for example, the end of the string. <coughs> so in general, we have two different types of boundaries. We're going to have one, which is called a fixed boundary. And the second one, which is called an unfixed boundary. Or sometimes we're gonna call this closed or the fixed, and sometimes we're gonna call this one unfixed or the, or open, open for the unfixed boundary. So we wanna see what happens. What types of waves can we actually create? What happens when this thing reaches a boundary? We will talk about that in a little more depth. So let's say here, this is my scenario. So I have a string here and I'm gonna send a pulse on the string and I'm gonna clamp it down here so that this is gonna be a fixed boundary point. And let's see what actually happens. Okay. So make sure this is in slow motion. So I'm gonna send in my pulse. My pulse is gonna come in. It's going to hit the boundary. Let's try that so here. Let's do fixed endpoint, pulse. So pulse, not oscillation, thank you, slow-mo, and this guy. So good, let's send in our pulse. Our pulse comes in, sends our wave, encounters with the boundary, and then reflects off and goes in the opposite direction. Good. So what happened at the boundary? What observation can we make? What happens to the amplitude at the boundary? So what happens at the height of the wave? Let's watch that again. So it comes in. By the time it gets to the boundary, it goes down. So what is our first observation we can make? What happens to the amplitude? Richie, what happened at the boundary? Uh, it became zero. Good. So at the boundary, first thing we notice is that the amplitude goes the zero. So in this case, our wave comes in, our amplitude simply goes to zero. That was our first observation. So let's go ahead and put in a reference line so we can see where that comes in. So again, here, if I put it at its amplitude, by the time it reaches the boundary, amplitude goes to zero and then it reflects off. Good. What's the second observation we can see? So it hits a boundary. Part of the wave then is gonna be reflected backwards. So that's the portion of the wave that we're watching as it moves back to the left. So initially we're sending in a right moving wave, interacts, amplitude goes to zero. We now have a reflected wave, which is now moving backwards. But how does that reflected wave compare to the original wave? How does it phase? Is it in phase? meaning that it gets reflected off exactly upward like it was when it originally moves in. So here, if I again put in my pulse, we would say this thing has an original phase, then hits the boundary, gets reflected backwards. How does its phase compare to the original phase? Is it in phase or out of phase? Meaning does it have the same orientation as the original wave? What do you think? So is the orientation the same? 
meaning originally the bump was above. Way to reflect, is the bump still above? No, good. So that means it can't be in phase. So in this case, we can say that the reflected wave is actually out of phase from the original wave. So the reflected wave is out of phase. But how much is it out of phase? Was well, out of phase by 180 degrees. So it is out of phase by 180 degrees or pi rays. So let's watch that again. <clears throat> so again, I'm going to send my pulse. My pulse is going to come in. In this case, my pulse is originally some particular phase, this thing is moving in, it's then going to interact with the boundary, at which point the amplitude goes to zero, gets reflected back. In this case, it has the opposite orientation in which it started, which means that this thing is out of phase from the original. Mm -hmm. So anytime it encounters a fixed endpoint, which is what's happening down here too, again, the amplitude goes to zero, gets flipped upward, means it gets shifted in phase by 180 degrees. Now again, this is only the reflected part. So typically what happens at a boundary is you get two pieces of wave. There's gonna be a reflected portion and there's gonna be a transmitted portion, which is the portion which goes beyond the boundary. We'll talk about that in just a second. So now let's talk about the unfixed. What happens in an unfixed? So here, let me stop this, start. In this case, I'm gonna put a loose endpoint. So imagine that this is basically just a loop on a pole and this thing is now a free to move up and down. It's gonna do whatever it wants to do. So now let's send in a pulse. So I guess my pulse initially has some sort of amplitude, encounters the boundary, and then gets reflected backwards. So what's the observation now? So first, let's talk about the reflection. Is the reflected wave in phase or out of phase with the original wave? If I send this guy back in again, this guy moves in, encounters the boundary, <coughs> Now the reflected wave moves in this direction. Is the reflected wave in phase or out of phase with the original wave? Meaning does it have the same orientation or not? Yes, it has the same orientation. So now we can say for a fixed endpoint, the reflected wave is in phase with the original wave. So that means there's a phase difference of either zero degrees or 360 degrees, which is then two pi radians. <clears throat> what about the amplitude? What happens to the amplitude? So again, now if I restart this and I send in my pulse, pulse comes in, has the initial amplitude, this then comes in, encounters with the boundary. What happens to the amplitude this time? Did it still go to zero? No, good. So the amplitude did not go to zero. What in fact happened to the amplitude? Did it increase, decrease? What do you think? So what happened to the amplitude this time? That increase or decrease? It's doubled, right? What actually happened in this case is that the amplitude, the original amplitude, now goes to twice of the amplitude. So what happens in this case is by the time it encounters this unfixed boundary, this amplitude actually doubles. So how do we understand this? So let's talk about how we understand this. The way we understand this is to use this idea of interference or what we call superposition. So let's say initially here's my wave. This guy is moving in in this direction. So here's my wave. Let's say initially it's moving here with a velocity of V. This thing has an initial amplitude of A. And let's say this is my fixed endpoint. So here we have a wave which is coming in from the left hand side, moving to the right, has a particular amplitude, has a velocity, and then it's going to encounter the boundary where its amplitude has to go to zero. Okay? So what we imagine what's going on is simultaneously outside of the boundary, there is a secondary wave which is moving to the left, which is out of phase from the original wave. So here is my secondary wave, 
moving now to the left with exactly the same velocity with exactly the same amplitude. So this one now is moving from the right to left. So it's moving in the left direction. This one is moving left to right, so it's moving to the right. They have exactly the same amplitude, exactly the same velocity, except the one on the right is out of phase from the second one. <laughs> so what happened is, eventually, these two things are going to superimpose on each other. So as this one moves, this one moves, these two things will encounter each other directly at the boundary. So this one is still going to be moving to the right with a velocity of v with an amplitude of a. This one is going to be moving to the left, superimposed on top of this guy, where again, his velocity is going to be moving to the left, and he's going to have an amplitude of A. The net result of this is that I would add the fact that these two amplitudes are in opposite directions. So I would add the two amplitudes together. So here we would say amplitude 1 minus amplitude 2 is then equal to 0 for then the total amplitude. Since these guys are directly out of phase with each other, that then gives us a total of zero amplitude. Now, as time keeps going, what will happen then is this wave, the blue one, will actually continue then moving to the left. Oops, sorry. Not long time. This one continue moving to the left. With again, the amplitude, which was the same, velocity now v, and then the one which is moving to the right. We'll keep moving this direction with a velocity v, amplitude of a. So to understand this, again, what we're going to say is that we have two waves. Even though this one is out past the boundary, so this is in a different medium, is moving in this direction. This one's moving. These two are going to meet directly at the boundary, superimpose on top of each other, which then gives me a total amplitude equal to zero. Meanwhile, the one which was moving to the left continues moving to the left, while the one which was moving to the right continues to move to the right which is why we see this thing then out of phase by 180 degrees. So this is what happens at a fixed endpoint. At an unfixed endpoint, so let's look at unfixed, we're going to say the same thing. So here I have this initial wave, which is moving to the right. Here's my boundary. I have this wave, which is going to be moving to the left. So let's go back to here. So this one's moving with velocity v, amplitude of a. This one is going to be moving to the left, velocity b, amplitude a. So as time goes on, what will happen is these two, again, will meet directly at the boundary. But at the boundary, what happens is since these guys are in phase with each other, they're going to superimpose on top of each other in exactly the same orientation, which means that now the total amplitude is going to be equal to the sum of the two amplitudes, which then gives us twice the amplitude. So the black one is still moving to the right, velocity b. Blue one is still moving to the left, velocity b. So that at a later time, in this case, what I have it now is that now the black one it continues to move to the right, same orientation which it had before, a, moving to the right, velocity b. The blue one then is continuing moving to the left, amplitude a, velocity b which is why it stays in phase with the original, because in this case, the two amplitudes have the sum together. Okay. So this is wave interference. So in general, what this basically tells us is what? We have two types of interference then. We have what's known as constructive interference, and we have what's known as destructive interference. Constructive interference occurs then when two waves end up at the same point where they're in phase with each other. So this is at a given location. The two waves or more arrive in phase with each other. If they're in phase with each other, what that means then is that the total amplitude is then going to be equal to the amplitude of the first wave plus the amplitude of the second wave. This would then be the total amplitude. 
when I have constructive interference, that means at a single point in space, these two will arrive in phase with each other. So the two are both orientation is the same. They just might have two different amplitudes so that the sum of the amplitudes is then equal to the total amplitude. Destructive interference occurs then at a given point, a given location, the two waves or more arrive out of phase with each other. In this case, the total amplitude is then simply equal to the difference between the two amplitudes. I'm going to put an absolute value on there because I'm just going to talk about the magnitude of the amplitude. <laughs> so in this case, the total amplitude then is equal to the sum of the two amplitudes. So basically it just means that what if I have one wave, which looks like this, so this is amplitude one, and I have a secondary wave, which is out of orientation, but as say a much smaller amplitude, a two, then the superposition of those two waves is going to give me an amplitude, which is then the difference of those two. So this is then going to be a total. So a total would be the difference between those two, if they're out of phase with each other. Now here we're making a slight simplification. That slight simplification is that we're pretending that all the phases are the same, or not the phases, but the frequencies are the same. So these are only true with same frequency. If we have different frequencies, that gives us something different. We'll talk about that later. What happens in those cases? So this is called wave interference or superposition of waves. We get two different phenomena that will happen. Either we're going to get constructive interference, which means the two waves arrive in phase with each other. So what happens in that case then is the amplitude is going to just be the sum of the two amplitudes together. Or we get destructive interference, which again means at a single point, these things arrive out of phase with each other. So one is say upward orientated, the other one's going to be downward orientated. In this case, we're then going to have an amplitude, which is the difference between those two amplitudes. So superposition of waves can give us all kinds of interesting things. And the first thing we want to look at is what's known as a standing wave. Let's do a fixed endpoint here. So what's a standing wave? So a standing wave, as it turns out, we won't show this in a second, is the superposition of two traveling waves where those two traveling waves are moving in opposite directions. So let's put this on oscillate. So here what's happening is I have a left or right moving wave. This is then going to interact with the boundary, which means I have another wave which is moving to the left. Here we then create the standing wave. So again, I have a left right moving wave moving in here. I have some particular amplitude and orientation. Simultaneously coming in from nowhere is then the other wave. That other wave then moves to the left, but it's completely out of phase from the first wave, which then leads to this guy, which is called the standing wave. So how's a standing wave different from a traveling wave? Well, first of all, here this is a traveling wave or a periodic wave. The standing wave, notice what's happening is this guy is only harmonically oscillating up and down. There is no moving part of the wave anymore. So here we don't have a wave moving in this direction. These two waves are moving in opposite directions, simultaneously superimposing on top of each other, creating this standing wave. The standing wave is different since the wave itself is not moving, it is simply harmonically oscillating down, which is then creating points like this, which are called nodes. Okay. These nodes are places which are fixed in position and time. So as this thing harmonically oscillates up and down, this node never moves its location. It will always be at that particular location. It will never migrate in one direction or another. So here we create these standing waves by superimposing two traveling waves on top of each other. So again, this wave is moving this way. Another wave is moving simultaneously in here. These two waves start superimposing on top of each other. The right moving wave continues to move. The left moving wave continues to move. But the superposition of those two waves gives me this standing wave. Now notice the other thing that happens is the amplitude actually doubles. So this thing starts oscillating harmonically with an amplitude which was twice the size of the original. And it creates these nodes. So again, the location of these nodes never change. 
And this thing simply oscillates at this point. This node will never move to the left, never move to the right. This wave will simply oscillate up and down. So this is what we call a standing wave. <coughs> so a standing wave is one that does not move, it does not propagate. It simply is going to oscillate with these fixed end pieces or these fixed nodes. Now, anybody who plays a musical instrument, this is what you create when you play your musical instrument. So if you play guitar, in this case, you strum the guitar string, whether it's a note or a chord. In that case, it's vibrating at a particular frequency. But the wave itself is not moving up and down, it is simply oscillating. If you play a wind instrument, something like a flute, <coughs> pardon me, a saxophone, trombone, any of these things, this is also the same. Even if you play a percussion instrument, such as drums, what happens in that case is the drum head is actually vibrating. It's vibrating with these particular fixed frequencies. Now, what we hear then, something like a guitar string or a flute or a percussion, is then the transmitted portion or refracted portion of the wave. Now, what happens is, once the wave is transmitted from one boundary to another boundary, it turns out that the frequency of vibration stays exactly the same. Okay? Which basically means that if I had a wave which was moving down a string, for example, by the time it reaches this boundary point, the wave continues to move now in this particular medium. So if this is medium one, this is then medium two. What happens is whatever frequency it had here stays exactly the same frequency as here. So that means when I play my guitar, my guitar strings vibrate at a particular frequency. But what I hear in air, even though the string has sent the sound across the boundary out into the air, the air molecules then vibrate at exactly the same frequency as that guitar string. What is different though, is the fact that since this is a medium, this has a velocity at which it moves V1, this also has a different velocity V2 which means that since the two frequencies are the same, we then have that V1 divided by lambda 1 must be equal to V2 divided by lambda 2. Which means that the wavelength inside of medium 1 is different than the wavelength inside of medium 2 because the speeds of the waves are different in those two mediums. But the proportionality between the velocity and the wavelength must be fixed because the two frequencies are the same. So when I strum my guitar string and it's vibrating at say 440 hertz, the sound I hear in air is also 440 hertz. But on a guitar string, the, string, the speed is moving at one speed versus in air, it's moving at the speed of air. So the wavelength changes to make sure that the frequency stays the same. So <clears throat> let's talk more about these standing waves. So let's talk about standing waves with two fixed endpoints. Two fixed endpoints. So again, what's going to happen is I'm going to send a traveling wave. So the initial wave at which I'm going to send, I'm going to call that D1, is then equal to the amplitude times sine of omega t minus kx. So this is a right moving wave. So this is my initial right moving wave. Since I have a fixed endpoint, what has to happen then is the reflected wave, which we're going to call D2. So this is our reflected wave. Has the same amplitude, sine of omega t, plus, plus sign here means that it's moving to the left, k times x plus r phase factor, where this thing is now out of phase by pi radians. Well, I take the pi in here, all that's going to do is it's going to make this a negative. So I get minus a sine of omega t plus k times x. So this is my reflected wave. So this is my initial wave, which is moving to the right. At the boundary, I now have my reflected wave, which is then moving to the left which is now moving in the opposite direction, hence the positive sign, but it's also out of phase, which causes this negative sign here. <laughs> so what happens then if I superimpose these two on top of each other? So this means that the total wave that I'm gonna create then is gonna be equal to wave one plus then wave two. 
So it's going to be the same thing then as a times sine of omega t minus k times x minus a sine of omega t plus k times x. Here the amplitudes are the same, so let's go ahead and factor out that amplitude. So this becomes a then times sine of omega t minus kx minus sine of omega t plus k times x. So this basically means that I have what? Sine of a minus b plus, or sorry, minus, let's do it this way, plus sine of a minus b. That's what you back away with. That's fine. Make that a plus. Make that a minus. So who's savvy on your trig identities? So if I take a sine of a double angle, subtract that from another sine of a double angle, what is the product of this? How many people remember all your trig identities? Not so much. That's fine. So <clears throat> Actually, no, let's do this differently. Let's call this whole thing A. So let's do sine of A minus sine of B. Let's do it a little bit easier. So it turns out that if I do this, this becomes twice of sine, or sorry, cosine of A plus B divided by two times sine of A minus B divided by two. So basically, if I take a sine of an angle, minus sine of a different angle, the result of that becomes then twice of then cosine of the sum of those two angles divided by two times sine of the difference between those angles divided by two. So here we're defining that a is equal to omega t minus kx and v then is equal to omega t plus k times x. <laughs> so if I plug this in, if I take a plus b, what's going to happen is the kx portion is going to cancel. So this becomes twice of omega t times time divided by 2, which is simply omega t. So this is going to be the same thing then as amplitude back in here, twice on the amplitude times cosine of omega t. Sine, well, if I put in the sine, in this case, then I get an omega t minus kx minus omega t minus kx. So in that case, what ends up happening is the omega t's are going to cancel. I'm left with twice of k times x divided by 2, which is simply k times x. So this is then simply k times x. So the total wave that we end up having then is going to be simply equal to now twice of the amplitude times cosine of omega t times sine of k times x. This is the total wave. Now, notice what happens. And this is actually very important when it comes to standing waves. Notice that the original traveling wave had both t and x in the same trig term. But now what's happening is for the standing wave, the time portion and the cosine portion are now split up into two different trig terms. So what's happening here is this portion which now has the t in it is separated from this portion of the x. So what's actually interesting, which is happening is again, two traveling waves, which are moving in opposite directions with a rotation of 180 degrees between the two for the reflected portion, gives me now a wave, which has now separate time from position, which means that this thing is not a traveling wave anymore. To have a traveling wave, I have to have X and T within the same trig term, but now I have two different trig terms, each one with a different X and different T. Now, this portion here, this one is actually the most interesting one. This thing is actually simply a time dependent amplitude. It's called that A of T. So what's happening here is this thing is saying that in position, my system looks simply like a sine curve at all times. So if I was looking at the string, I would simply have a sine curve on that string. That's it. This portion here is controlling how it harmonically oscillates up and down. So this entire term here, the 2a cosine of omega t, is simply the amplitude of that sine curve. Which means that this a of t then is going to be equal to twice the amplitude times cosine of omega t. So basically, if I put these two things together, what this means then is if I was looking at the total versus position, this thing simply looks like a sine curve at all times. That's it. 
this is what the profile looks like. So here I have three nodes. I have this point here, I have this point here, and I have this point here. These are what we call nodes. So the nodes are positions where x is equal to zero, or d is equal to zero, for all times. Now what the amplitude is doing is it's causing each one of these positions to harmonically oscillate so that as time goes on, the amplitude then starts to decrease. So what the red portion is doing is that it's controlling the harmonic oscillation of these particles as they are moving up and down. But it still looks like a sine curve. So what it's doing is going from a sine curve to a smaller amplitude until it eventually goes to zero. Flips orientation then becomes a negative sine curve until it reaches its maximum. Then starts to decrease again, flips orientation, and it goes back and forth. But these locations of the nodes, this location here, this location here, and this location here, these never actually change positions. These stay fixed at all times. But the height at which this is happening, this is that A of T. So what the height is doing, or that A portion is doing, is it's controlling the height, controlling the displacement, causing those particles to simply harmonically oscillate up and down. So this is what defines the standing wave. The fact that the traveling wave, which had both T and X within the same trig term, now split up into two different trig terms, where the total amplitude becomes twice of what it actually was. But again, the profile and position always looks like simply a sine curve. Now, if I want to know the location of all these nodes, so how do we determine the location of the nodes? Well, to determine the location of the nodes, what we need is that the total wave, d total, must be equal to zero. So it has to be true is that for all times, d total must be equal to zero at the location of the node. So this is then going to be equal to that a of t times then sine of kx. Now, since this has to be true at any time, we can then divide everything through by the amplitude. Let's just get rid of that. So what this means then is I need zero then is equal to sine of k times x. Now, where is sine equal to zero? So what values of, what's that? Pi over two, 3 pi over 2, well, that's when sine is equal to 1. Well, what is sine equal to 0? That would be true for cosine. Good, so pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, et cetera. So let's take an inverse sine of both sides. So what this says then is we need n times pi and then must be equal to k times x. <clears throat> now, what's also interesting about this is that what? We need this thing to be 0 at x is equal to L. So let's look at x is equal to L. So when x is equal to L, we then have n times pi then must be equal to k times L, which means that k must then be equal to n pi divided by L. So we know where the k sub n. <coughs> we'll make a big point out of this in a second. This also says that the wavelength then must be equal to what? The velocity divided by kn must then be equal to what? Uh, so I need to split this thing upside down. So this then must be equal to. Did I do that backwards? Oh yeah, I did that. Oh, let's talk about frequency. Sorry. So this is then lambda n is equal to two pi divided by k n, which is then equal to n times l divided by n pi times two pi. So what will happen in this case then is I think that should be two pi. Yeah, 2 pi times L, there we go, which is then equal to the pi's are going to cancel, so it's going to be twice of L divided by N. So these are then the wavelengths. Now what's interesting about this, again, is what basically it says is the fact that since I have a standing wave, these standing waves have to have a beginning which is at zero and an end which is at zero. 
which means that we can only then fit certain wave numbers inside of this wave when it goes from zero to zero. And what that means then is we can only have certain wavelengths. And that means that the frequency must then be equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength, which means this is going to be then n times v divided by twice the length. So the fact that I have a standing wave, the standing wave then forces the fact that we can only have particular wave numbers, forces the fact that we can only have particular wavelengths, which forces the fact we can only have particular frequencies. So as this string is vibrating, since it's creating a standing wave, since I have to have zero on one side and zero on the other side, we can only then fit particular wavelengths in there. We can only fit particular wave, wave numbers in there, which means we can also pretend fit only particular frequencies. So to show what I'm talking about here, let's draw a picture. So let's say here's my string, and this thing has a length of L. This is my length L. Now what I know is I have to have a fixed endpoint on one side, a fixed endpoint on the other side, which means the simplest thing I can fit inside of here is simply this guy. This is one thing that's allowed to fit. Or, the next simplest thing I can have is actually this guy. The next simplest thing I can have is then this guy, and etc. This top one is what we call n is equal to one, is what's known as the fundamental. This is the fundamental frequency or the fundamental wavelength, which is allowed to fit within inside of this distribution. This one then is n is equal to two. This one then is n is equal to three. So effectively what this thing is doing is it's counting the number of nodes besides the x is equal to zero. So for n is equal to one, I have the one node at x is equal to L. n is equal to two, I have a single node here, which is at the center, a second node, which is here at L is equal to two. So this is then this guy. n is equal to three, I have a node here, I have a node here, and I have a node here. So the fact that this thing has to have a beginning and an end, which is that x is equal to zero, forces the fact that I can only have particular frequencies which are allowed to vibrate on the string. I can have this frequency, I can have this frequency, I can have this one, or in this case, this wavelength, this wavelength, and this wavelength. So notice here, what this is, this is half a wavelength. So inside of this length L, we're fitting in exactly half a wavelength, which means that the wavelength here is simply equal to twice the length. For this one, we're fitting an entire wavelength, so the wavelength then is equal to the length, which means that the wavelength then is equal to twice the length divided by two. Finally, for this one, we have the length then is equal to three halves of a wavelength, which then means that the wavelength is equal to twice of the length divided by three, and et cetera. So here, the fact that this thing has to start and finish at the same n means the wavelength then has to go as twice the length divided by n, where n is what's known as the harmonic. Each one of these harmonics are determining how this thing is actually vibrating. So again, n is equal to one gives me the fundamental, that's half the wavelength. n is equal to two gives me the second harmonic. n is equal to three gives me the third harmonic, and et cetera. <laughs> So in physics, this is what we call quantization. So what's happening here is my system is forced to be quantized. I'm forced to have only a discrete value or number of values which are allowed to actually vibrate on my string. So we're out of time. So tomorrow or Wednesday, sorry, we'll do an example and then I'll give you some guys some group projects to work on. What's up, Nathana? Can you go back the Sure. You got it? Okay, good. Oh. Stop recording here for a second.